Hello everyone. I hope you are happy and healthy and well. For today, I want to say a few things about Act One of Lorraine Hainsbury's stunning play, A Raisin in the Sun, written, published, and first performed in 1959. But before I do that, I just wanted to say a few things about the cultural conditions that help to inform the narrative of the play itself, because understanding that helps to perhaps frame some of the choices that characters make, some of the points of conversation they have, but perhaps even the the possible motivations for someone like Hainsbury, while it's impossible to know fully and in a comprehensive way, an author's intent, I think, considering Hainsbury was a writer of color, and considering this play, if you want to think about the publication, 1959, it's possible to imagine that this play is something of a prelude for the civil rights movement that follows in the 1960s. Not that, and I think this is a mistake people often make when they think about race relations and civil rights in the United States. They imagine, well, once the American Civil War ended in 1865 and slaves were freed, well, what did we did we just not think about or talk about race until the 1960s and there's this whole period after the failure of reconstruction in 1877 and the jim crow laws that were instituted in the american south that helped to uh, inform the way writers like Hainsbury think about race and think about race relations. And there is this connection or this through line between the liberation of slaves after the American Civil War to Reconstruction, to the failures of Reconstruction, to Jim Crow, to civil rights. And I want to talk a bit about what happened in that period after the failures of Reconstruction and the the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And I think one of the important things to consider, especially with this play, is geography. So this play is set in Chicago. And Chicago and Harlem in New York, when thinking about race and these potential or hypothetical utopias for people of color in the United States, those are two extremely important places, Chicago and Harlem. And the reason why the living conditions are the way they are in Hainsbury's play is because there was this great migration in the early 20th century, large numbers, hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of African Americans migrating from the Jim Crow South to these northern cities. And this this migration, the promise of this migration was greater opportunity for equality and equal treatment, but maybe just in simplest terms, fleeing the violence that existed in the American South during this time. But what writers like Hainsbury and even Langston Hughes, someone she references early in the play, my God, she even borrows language from one of his poems for the title of this play. One of the things that these sorts of writers and these sorts of figures grappled with was how the promise of the North as this utopia for black people was a promise that was regrettably broken. Now, and maybe you might even go as far as to say it was it was an understandable but naive thing to imagine that there were these spaces where hundreds of thousands or millions of people of color could live with equal opportunity, with the freedom from fear of 
physical violence, psychological violence, emotional violence, maybe, and, and some scholars have suggested that perhaps there was something unfortunately naive about this, but that was very much the promise. But what Hainsbury dramatizes and what writers like Langston Hughes in his poetry and in his essays, even figures like James Baldwin, did something quite similar. They wanted to understand the ways in which forms of racial inequality were reproduced, but it just looked different in the North than in the South. So one example is housing. And if you're unfamiliar with redlining as a practice, I would encourage you to do a bit of research because that's that's what we see with the youngers in this apartment they live in. It is a place that is in complete disarray. It's, it's decaying right under their feet. And this is something that people of color experienced in northern cities like Chicago and Harlem, these, these places that were poorly kept, that were often more expensive than white housing of similar or equivalent standards. And it's also important to mention, or it's important to acknowledge that this practice of redlining, this was not a matter of self-segregation. And again, this is an idea that Hainsbury dramatizes directly in the play. There were places and there were residential areas that black people were forbidden to occupy. To be quite frank about it, People would not rent to, and when I say people, I mean a white majority, would not rent to or sell housing to black people. So they were restricted to these particular areas, and because those areas were not well-maintained, because they were overpopulated, it started to uh, create or perpetuate certain racial and socioeconomic ideas about the differences between white people and black people, which is a convoluted way of saying people extrapolate a fair amount from one's living conditions. And I think for a writer like Hainsbury, part of how she wants to understand and dramatize racial inequality is to connect it to housing and living conditions. And she wants to connect everything from job opportunities, and job opportunities, of course, are connected to and correlate with socioeconomic mobility. She wants to connect all of this to one's living conditions and how, in particular, for people of color, a white majority may create or produce these self-fulfilling prophecies. But before I talk about some of the particulars of the play, I wanted to say a quick something about this character, Benita, who she's the younger of the two younger children. So there's Walter Lee and Benita, and Walter Lee's the older son, and Benita's the younger daughter, and she has this whole B-plot or subplot, and it's a distinctly romantic triangle relationship situation. It feels a lot like the sort of thing you might see in a Shakespearean comedy, but it's important to notice a few things about Benita, and in particular her romantic interests, because it helps to inform another conversation that Hainsbury clearly wants to understand, and it's this conversation about whether black people should be assimilationists or accommodationists, or whether they should hew closer to uh, this idea of Africa, this, this sense that Africa is this place that houses this idea about what it means to be a person of color. And on one side, there's this character, George 
Merchantson, and he is in many ways an assimilationist figure. He's someone who is black, but he has successfully, it seems, navigated this predominantly white world by perhaps attempting to uh, suppress whatever his identity might be, could be, and because of that, and this is language that's used explicitly in the play, because of that, he is seen or understood as an accommodationist or an assimilationist. He's someone who has, who has bought into some of the predominantly white ideas about the world, societal structures, and I'll talk about that later when I talk about some of the particulars of the play. But then on the other side, we have this figure, Joseph Asagai, and he is from Nigeria, and he represents, he is not, and I think this is important, he's not African-American, he's African, and he represents an entirely different understanding or an expression of what it could mean to be a person of color. And for someone like Benita, I think her her trajectory and her character arc is to understand which of these two and, and these characters are these two these two romantic interests they're more than just romantic interests for Benita they function allegorically they represent a particular set of ideas and for her it seems as if what Hainsbury wants to do is to use this triangle relationship as a way of dramatizing Benita's struggle with her own sense of identity because she is very young compared to Walter and some of the other characters in the play and she is extremely interested in forming or constructing an identity and both of those romantic figures represent what she could be, but for someone like Hainsbury, it also seems that they represent what, at least during the time this play was produced, what sorts of choices were available for people of color. What what could someone of color ultimately be? Is it is it better? Is it more advantageous to be an assimilationist, an accommodationist, or is is this 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 increased interest in Africa, in African heritage, and everything that's bundled with it? Is that potentially a better choice for a figure like Benita? And the final thing I'll say is how this play enters into this preoccupation that the 20th century has, and we certainly have it today, about, well, what does it mean to be an American, and what is this American theatrical tradition? What does it look like, and what sorts of ideas does it value? And I think one of them is is this idea of America as this place where any one of us, if we work hard enough, if we have the correct sorts of morals and ethics and ideas, we will succeed. And I'm describing at this point the American dream. And a lot of literature from the 20th century and still even the 21st century grapples with the lie of the American dream and how one's autonomy and independence is not enough to guarantee one's success. It's a genre of literature that also thinks about how there are larger cultural and societal both institutions and ideas that may prevent a single individual despite how willing and prepared they are to work for their future. There are these kinds of ideas and institutions that frankly prevent 
some of us, if not all of us, from doing what we ultimately want to do and being who we ultimately want to be. And perhaps what's different about Hainsbury and her contribution to this conversation is that she adds this dimension of race. Because if you want to think about the sorts of plays that engage in these sorts of ideas, you might think about novels like The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, Death of a Salesman, Of Mice and Men. But those are all plays and novels written by white men about predominantly white male characters. And for Hainsbury, she wants to possibly ask similar sorts of questions. And because of that, this is a distinctly American play. But maybe the question I would challenge you to consider, especially if you've read plays like Death of a Salesman or novels like The Great Gatsby or novellas like Of Mice and Men, how does this inclusion of race change, if at all, the dimensions of this conversation about the American dream and the sorts of ideas, often wildly naive ideas about what America affords each and every one of us and how some of those ideas, again, the, the value of hard work, independence, etc., too often that doesn't create the conditions for anyone, if any of us, to succeed, that it's, it's frankly far more complicated than that. And the American dream often simplifies it or, or tries to provide uh, simple answers for complex questions and problems. And I think Hainsbury's intervention here by, by incorporating race into this is yet another way of challenging the supremacy of the American dream as an idea. So, okay, let's talk about some of the particulars from Act One. And I think I want to start with just this description of the Younger's apartment and what that might suggest and how that might complement some of the things I've already said about housing and racial discrimination, but also this this promise that is often left unfulfilled. So I'll start on page 1457 and... This is what Hainsbury writes. The younger living room would be a comfortable and well-ordered room if it were not for a number of indestructible contradictions to this state of being. Its furnishings are typical and undistinguished, and their primary feature now is that they have clearly had to accommodate the living of too many people for too many years and they are tired. Still, we can see that at some point, a time probably no longer remembered by the family, except perhaps for Mama, the furnishings of this room were actually selected with care and love and even hope, and brought to this apartment and arranged with taste and pride. That was a long time ago. Now the once-loved pattern of the couch upholstery has to fight to show itself from under acres of crocheted doilies and couch covers which have themselves finally come to be more important than the upholstery. And here a table or a chair has been moved to disguise the worn places in the carpet, but the carpet has fought back by showing its weariness with depressing uniformity elsewhere on its surface. Weariness has, in fact, won in this room. So Hainsbury tells us almost everything we need to know, not only about this place, but about how, as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, real estate and living conditions connect to and and complement, perhaps even inform, racial forms of inequality. But this also gives us a sense, this functions as a kind of microcosm. It's allegorical for this broken promise of the northern city for people of color who migrated to them. We're told, for example, that even though it doesn't look it now, 
It's entirely possible to imagine that so much of this was once selected with care and promise. Notice that word promise appears more than once, but the word that also appears, it seems, more than once is tired and weary, as if to suggest the breaking of this promise and the amount of time or the duration of time between, for a character like Mama, arriving in a place like Chicago with all of these promises, with all of this hope, and where they are now. It has produced this feeling of futility that everything, again, just think about how you feel when you were offered this promise, whether it was explicit or implicit, and how it feels when you see that promise left unfulfilled. And when you even perhaps come to this realization that the promise was never made at all, or, or maybe, and I think this is more frustrating, it was made, but no one at any point had any intention to fulfill it. They were simply interested in giving you a seductive promise with no intention of, of making good on it. And that's the sort of living space, but also the feeling and the sensation that Hainsbury enters into or, or allows us to enter into at the beginning of this play. This is a, this is a place, and, and I would also bring to your attention how Hainsbury is so specific that part of the problem, and this connects back to what I said earlier about the way that housing for people of color was, is maintained, or, or to be more accurate, how it isn't maintained. This reference to uh, this space and how it's accommodated too many people for too long. Again, just thinking about how that functions symbolically, how that functions metaphorically for the actual lived experience of African Americans in this country, the spaces they occupy, those spaces we've asked them, they've asked them to house and accommodate too many people for too long. So from here, I think what I want to do, because I'm well over 20 minutes, is to just say a few things about a few of the main characters. And I think maybe a great place to start is with a character like Walter, this this older or this oldest son who, uh, because his father's dead and because there is something quite traditional about the familial structure, it seems to be, and it's interesting because it gestures towards something traditional or gestures toward the want and desire for something traditional, which is to say having a, a male patriarchal figure at the top, in control, in charge, but while it might gesture toward and, and perhaps even aspire to that idea, this is a home and this is a family that's frankly a matriarchy because Mama is very much in a position of power, both within the house itself in a social aspect, but also financially, economically, because of this check that's coming, this insurance check. So despite perhaps what Walter would want and despite the implicit preference toward a structure more patriarchal, this is a distinctly matriarchal family. But I think part of the reason why is not just for economic reasons. I think what we see with a character like Walter is someone who's in a state of arrested development. He is quite petulant and reactive, and it's perhaps important to think about, well, what does that ultimately suggest? Is that a, is that a failing of Walter as an individual? Is he simply not mature? Or is it possible, and I think this is where Hainsbury is quite clever, is it possible that the social conditions have produced this sense that Walter is 
someone who's immature, who's in this state of arrested development. There's this way that social and economic depression actually causes particular individuals to not grow and to not mature as rapidly and effectively and efficiently as they otherwise would. And we'll see this later in the play. All Walter really needs is just a quantum of hope that things will improve, that he has a path forward for his behavior to fundamentally change. And I think that's one of the more interesting subtleties of the play, that here at the beginning, we might think that Walter is, if you don't mind, a bit of an asshole. But what we see later in the play is that while he might, while that might to some degree be true, correct, and accurate, there's far more to it than that. Again, Walter, perhaps as a single individual, is not as responsible for his actions as we often assume. Maybe one of the reasons why Walter acts the way he acts and behaves the way he behaves is because of these forms of oppression that have passed from generation to generation. Again, the weight of a of a promise unfulfilled. The the and in Walter you can see him like this reference to the Langston Hughes poem at the beginning, like the title itself, he's just someone who like a raisin is is just utterly dehydrated. He's been he's been mined of all of his life and vitality. And again, you could imagine that it's not just for Walter as an individual, but this is something that he's possibly inherited when we think about how Mama describes his father, her husband, and how he would spend his time at night in particular after these long and and unrelenting days at work. So Walter is an interesting figure in that regard. And again, the question I would maybe ask you to consider with a character like Walter, to what degree is he ultimately responsible for his behavior, his actions, and his choices? Because I think all of us are awash with this idea that we as individuals are wholly responsible for ourselves, but Perhaps what Hainsbury is encouraging us to think is that there are larger social conditions that create the conditions for certain types of behavior and for certain versions or iterations of ourselves to exist in the world. Now, Mama is an interesting figure as well, because while characters like Benita and more so Benita than Walter, but I think together they represent or symbolize the future. They're progressive figures in that way. Mama is a more traditional and perhaps by extension conservative figure. She very much represents the past and she has perhaps to your surprise, it was certainly to my surprise the first time I read this play, more optimism and hope than I would expect considering what she's experienced in her life. And there's this moment in Act One when she in effect says, I I simply don't understand my children because for myself, for my husband, we were just we just wanted an opportunity to live without the fear that a white mob would lynch us. And I think what's interesting about Mama and what's interesting about what she's articulating is how we often forget that the promises and the ideas that inspire us and our aspirations as individuals in many ways represent the aspirations of a generation. And especially when thinking about race relations in this country and thinking about this this desire for people of color and for all individuals, but especially for people of color, considering how the 
specter of racism and slavery still in many ways informs certain social conditions how once once you once you age out of your generation and into a new generation the ideas and promises that you and your generation aspire to perhaps they do seem a bit antiquated because ideally mama's children would want more than just to feel physically safe they would want and and mama for example often chastises walter for his focus and the way he fetishizes money but i think you could argue what mama might miss is how for someone like walter he is no longer unlike her and unlike her husband he is not afraid that a white mob might lynch him for him the best way to protect himself and protect his family is to experience social and economic mobility and prosperity so i think again the question that i would ask you to think with a character like mama is mama wrong in her critique of her children or is it possible that and she could be right to be fair or is it possible that what mama's ultimately experiencing is what many of us experience when the values that define our generation are not the same values that define the next generation or future generations and the question worth asking is well what does mama not see what does she not what is she potentially incapable of understanding and is there something perhaps problematic or destructive about this tradition or these set of traditional ideas that mama embodies because you could argue that what she misses or what she doesn't understand is how again for a character like walter safety is not about protecting himself physically from a white mob but it's more about material success and the sort of social mobility that's connected to or for many attached to material success now that's not to say that walter is a wholly likable figure and that's not to say that walter is an aspirational figure i've mentioned some of his petulance before but walter is also a unmistakable sexist and it's interesting to consider why hainsbury would incorporate that as a part of walter and walter's character because i think you could arrive at a couple of distinct conclusions perhaps hainsbury is offering something of a critique of masculinity and masculine chauvinism as if to say this is not exclusively a white male problem this is perhaps a male problem this is a chauvinistic patriarchal problem the way men whether they're white or black see perceive and understand women and an interesting counterpoint to that is a figure like benita his younger sister and i've spoken about benita already in this lecture so i don't think there's more i want to say about her but she is a character who because she's much younger she has a kind of spirit and vitality that characters like ruth and characters like walter don't seem to have she's also someone who's affiliated with this intellectual exploration in particular because she's someone who's a college student she has these aspirations to 
be a doctor, which is perhaps another way of saying she doesn't want to be a wife or a housewife. She doesn't want to occupy or assume a subordinate role in this heavily and highly unfair patriarchal system. She's something of an agitator in that way. And what she ultimately, again, perhaps through contrast, what she ultimately brings to our attention and perhaps what Hainsbury wants us to think about her is how she represents one vision or one picture or one idea of what freedom, liberation, and equality can look like for people of color in the United States. Because Walter, by contrast, and they're all within the same family, Walter, by contrast, is blue collar. He is someone who seems to symbolize the working class, while someone like Benita seems more, or at least she aspires to be white collar. She's part of this intellectual wing or facet, the intelligentsia, and just seeing the kind of fighting antagonism, and even on Walter's end, the hostility and and the envy that he projects out, especially when he thinks about himself and, again, this subordinate role he occupies both in society but within his own family, and this sense or this suggestion that even his younger sister, through her success, will further subordinate him. So, okay, I know that was quick, and I will say more about the play later this week. I'll make better reference or I'll make more references to uh, particular passages that I want you to think about and that might help you better understand what Hainsbury is attempting to grapple with and dramatize in this play. But until then, don't forget about your discussion post responsibilities. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. And the drama unit essay prompt. It's up. It's available. You should certainly start thinking about that essay. And if and when you have questions, don't hesitate to contact me.